Hey everybody, it's time for delicious Victory Coffee. Victory Coffee is the best kind. Mmm. Ah, that's good stuff. Well, I hope you've all been catching up on your Twitter feed today, especially my tweets, the most important tweets in the entire internet. And in particular, I hope you saw my most recent tweet in which I, uh, I give you a breaking fake news alert. So it's not a news alert, it's a, a fake news alert, meaning that there is a story in the news that has now been debunked. And it was a big story. <laughs> and it turns out it was complete bullshit. I'm talking about the Dr. Bandy Lee story. So if you don't know the story, a Yale, uh, Yale trained, um, I think she was trained by Yale, but anyway, she had lots of credentials. And she was a mental health expert. And the story was that she briefed members of Congress, half a dozen of them, and had concluded that the president, this was the fake news. The, the fake news was that she had concluded that the president was mentally unfit for office. Every news organization ran it. All the, all the network um, news ran it. There was only one problem. It didn't happen. <laughs> sure, she exists. She's a real person. She did have a meeting in Congress with real senators or real Congress people, whoever it was. But she didn't say what was reported. So Dr. Drew uh, did his interview with her. And you can see the link to that interview, uh, the audio interview from the radio on my web, uh, on my Twitter feed. You have to listen to it. All right. Compare what she says to Dr. Drew about what she believes about the president to everything that's been reported so far. <laughs> They're not the same. Her, her view, and it's a little hard to articulate because it's, it's, uh, it depends on a lot of her training, right? So I don't have her training, but the, the essence of it is that she does not have an opinion on Dr. Uh, that Dr. Bandy Lee does not in fact have an opinion, a professional opinion, on President Trump's mental capacity. She doesn't have an opinion on it. <laughs> the entire news last week is that she had an opinion and it was bad. She doesn't. What she has an opinion on <clears throat> is that the way he approaches things, his style, his manner of speaking, etc., could cause violence elsewhere. <clears throat> in other words, she's an expert on violence and these social interactions which cause them. And her concern is not that the president is competent or not competent, but that his style might um, infect the public in a way that could increase violence. Is that the story you heard? <laughs> That's not the story any of us heard. And just in time to, I hope, I hope it's not too late, uh, but the fake news, re fake news awards are tomorrow, I believe. So Wednesday, are, the president's going to do his fake news uh, uh, awards. And I hope it's still time for this one to make it into the, the final consideration. Because this one was great. I mean, as fake news goes, this is, this is as clean as you get. Now, I realize that <laughs> the Brian Ross fake news thing is going to get a lot of attention. Obviously, the, the, the Russia collusion thing is a big candidate for fake news. That was the biggest story of the year. So maybe that one has to get picture of the year, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> but this Dr. Bandy Lee fake news thing is about as clean as you can get for fake news. I mean, this, <laughs> this is really fake. Now, I'm going to do a, another Periscope a little later today, in which I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on just the one topic of the president's uh, mental capacity. <laughs> and you, you're going to want to watch that one. That, that one will be good. Um, in, in related news, related in the sense that it's uh, about the president, 
we see that uh, North Korea is playing nice with South Korea. Now, don't get too excited about this, because we've all seen this movie repeated and repeated. So we know, of course, that North Korea is trying to put a wedge between the United States and our ally, South Korea. So North Korea is trying to be just nice enough to South Korea that South Korea will try to talk the United States out of being aggressive toward North Korea. That, of course, is, is the play. Or at the very least, they'll buy some time through the Olympics to keep developing their, their nuclear weapons. But there is one important difference between this time that they're using that play that has worked all the times in the past. And, and yeah, there's a big difference this time. And, uh, <laughs> and the big difference is that President Trump is not going to stop squeezing the corporations that are doing the illegal uh, smuggling with North Korea. We saw that with South Korea grabbing two tankers, which obviously they coordinate with the United States on stuff like that. Um, so while it may be true that South Korea and North Korea will be talking friendly, it will have nothing to do with how hard President Trump is uh, stomping on their economy and how long he keeps doing it. So that's just not going to change. Now, there's some interesting things coming out of the story about North Korea and South Korea. One of the interesting things is that they're, apparently they've agreed for some kind of unified flag and uniform so that they will be competing as Koreans instead of North Korea and South Korea. I got to admit, I didn't know that was an option, but apparently it's something they've done, they did in the 2000 Olympics. Now, I've been predicting that the one and only uh, path to an, a non-nuclear North Korea and peace is to uh, have a, what I call a hundred-year plan for unification. And the beauty of the hundred-year plan is that all the people alive today who might have problems with it will be dead. So nothing has to happen in terms of a final form until all the people alive today are dead. So that makes everybody more flexible to agree to things that you wouldn't agree to in your lifetime. So, for example, Kim Jong-un uh, <laughs> might want to uh, stay in power for the rest of his life. So 100 years gets him that. And it gives him time to either get his kids out of the country or to make sure they have pardons or whatever it is so that you know his his line can be uh, can continue and they'll they'll all be multi-billionaires or whatever so they should be they should be fine now this uh, this unified uh, olympics business with the uh, unified uniforms and flags could be the first part of a 100 year plan for reunification and you just move really really slowly so for example you might talk about a little bit more travel. You might talk about a little more communication. You know, maybe someday a little bit of trade. You know, assuming the the nukes get taken care of. Um, so we may have we may have started walking in that direction. Now the interesting thing that North Korea said is that, uh, and this is sort of mind boggling, because uh, I'm not sure if there's some fake news involved here. And then, and which part is the fake part? But what North Korea said is that they don't have any weapons aimed at South Korea. They say that all of their weapons are aimed at America. Now, do they have some kind of artillery that's really, really long range? <laughs> is it possible that instead of tens of thousands of artillery pieces aimed at South Korea, that they either have none, or that all of their tens of thousands of artillery is aimed at the United States where it could never reach. <laughs> yeah, somebody's saying that they're, it's aimed at the DMZ. Hmm. I suppose you could 
You make an argument in that way. You know, like if the if somebody was flooding across the DMZ, they would just fill it with artillery. Maybe. I don't think so. But uh, it's an amazing claim. Um, it's amazing that they would claim that when it's so obviously not true. But let me ask you this. Are we sure it's not true? I mean, I think I'm sure it's not true. But look at how much fake news we've endured recently. All right, so North Korea is heading in an interesting direction, uh, but don't get too excited about the friendliness. Uh, It does buy us some time. There's almost no chance of war between now and the Olympics. (laughs) So the good news is no chance of war between now and the Olympics. So that's the only thing that's the guaranteed good news and that there's talking. And the President of the United States has said he would talk to North Korea, which is sort of a big deal. Now, he's not going to talk to them unless the nuclear weapons are on the table, I assume. But it's still a big deal that just that he said he would. All right, it's time for a simultaneous sip. Mmm, coffee. Ah. Now, my understanding is that the, um, the Koreans are sending a Taekwondo um, competitors. Now, I don't know how good these Taekwondo people are, but I worry that it's not uh, the first, the tip of their attack on South Korea, because maybe, you know, during the Olympics, the Taekwondo guys will they'll pretend they're in the competition, and then, you know, they'll all get the signal, the signal, bing! And they'll all change and they'll start attacking the crowd. And after the Taekwondo guys from North Korea have killed everybody in the Olympic Stadium, <clears throat> they'll run into the streets and just start killing people in South Korea. And then when they're done, after they've killed everybody in South Korea, they'll jump into the ocean and start swimming toward the United States. And that's when we have to get worried. Because those Taekwondo guys, they've been training for a long time. We don't know how good they are. <clears throat> and they might have freaking lasers on their heads, so all bets are off if they start coming our way. All right, let's talk about uh, David Brooks, his article in the New York Times. Uh, has everybody seen that? That's also tweeted in my tweet Twitter feed. You should check that out. Let me just give you the headline. <clears throat> the headline, where is it? Here it is. The headline, and this is from uh, David Brooks, um, who is a, a famous anti-Trumper of the nth degree. All right, so David Brooks has been about as anti-Trump as you can get. And he writes in the New York Times that the quality of the opposition is deteriorating. <laughs> you have to read it. <clears throat> so I don't, I, uh, the nth degree, yes, not the ninth degree. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the the also the North Koreans are sending uh, uh, ice skaters, so they'll actually have knives on their feet. So if the Taekwondo people and the ice skaters have doing any cross training, those skates are going to become deadly weapons, and uh, we should watch out for that. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, the David Brooks article is hilarious because he talks about how the anti-Trumpers are just have just turned into idiots at this point. <laughs> um, read also, this is also in my Twitter feed, uh, article in US State, USA Today by James Robbins. <clears throat> he quotes me, excuse me, just a second. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know what's wrong with me too. I'm just all full of happiness. Um, in USA Today, James Robbins quotes me about uh, the president being POTUS VSG uh, for very stable uh, genius and notes that the word genius will be paired with, with Trump forever. So he got his forever name. By the way, how many of you have seen my prediction play out that the word genius and Trump has been paired more than anything you've ever seen. Um, so somebody on Twitter sent me a, a Google Trend 
um, chart of where if you Google the, the terms Trump and genius, you'll see, you'll see this, the curve goes da 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 for years, and then it just went wow <laughs> through the ceiling. <laughs> yes, Trump did give himself his own forever name. Um, and I believe for years people will call him a very stable genius. <laughs> and eventually people will forget where that came from. And you will be subconsciously moved toward thinking of him as a genius. Uh, did I get her last name wrong? I'm being told that in my... Did I spell Bandy Lee wrong? Anyway, uh, I was just checking that I got my tweet right. So, uh, <laughs> who's going to win the fake news award? Well, um, that's a good question. I think the Brian Ross thing is a contender. I think the the Russian collusion is a contender. And now I think the Dr. Bandy Lee thing has got to be in the top three. So I, th I think the Dr. Bandy Lee story that got so much press has got to be in the top three. Let's do a uh, simultaneous sip to that. Mm. Yeah, Jim, <laughs> Jim Acosta might get some special kind of award. All right. Um, now, the other news is, did you see that there was a an attack on Syria? I guess attack on maybe a Russian base in Syria. Now, a Syrian Syrian uh, uh, military air force base. There was a an attack by coordinated multiple terrorist drones. This is a big deal because this is the future. This is what I predicted in 2004. So in 2004, my book called The Religion War, which was a sequel to my book, God's Debris. Uh, in, so in Syria, ISIS had put together a bunch of um, plane type drones. So they, they've got the fixed wing instead of the helicopter type. And apparently they sent them more than 50, 50 miles or 50 kilometers, I forget. Uh, yeah, 50 kilometers out, and instead of controlling them, they were GPS guided. That's what I predicted. GPS guidance, multiple drones from many miles away. How do you stop that? Well, it turns out the Russians did a good job, but they're also a military base. So if you attack a military installation with multiple drones, the military has a pretty good, pretty good chance of knocking them down, which is what the Russians did. They stopped all of them without human casualties, although I guess some, some planes got a, uh, some damage. Um, but what happens when these things are in the United States? Because you know they will be. Um, you're going to have multiple coordinated attacks, and the, and the bad part, <laughs> the bad part that you don't get in the Middle East is, you know, fires starting. In the Middle East, it's just going to be a building, you know, in, in the desert and stuff. So there's not much that catches on fire. But here it's going to be a more dangerous situation. Um, yeah, so those, I guess those drones were carrying mortar rounds. So, um, I, and also uh, apparently the small business consumer index hit a 17 year high. Can we just start calling the, the business consumer index the, the uh, presidential approval poll? You know, is there any situation in which uh, business and consumer confidence are not directly related to what people think of the president's job performance. Because even if the president were doing you know, good things about the economy, 
but terrible things overseas that would, would get us in trouble overseas, that would drive the consumer confidence down too. So there's almost nothing that the president does that doesn't have either a direct or an indirect impact on business and consumer confidence. So if those two things are reaching new highs, that, my friends, is the presidential approval poll in 2018. You know, the, the regular presidential approval polls are where they call up and say, hey, do you approve of the president? In some version, they say that. But that's just turned into attendance. So the presidential approval poll has turned into nothing but an attendance. It's just roll call. Are you a Republican? Yes. Do you approve of the president? Probably yes. Are you a Democrat? Yes. Do you approve of the president? Almost certainly no. The approval poll doesn't mean what it used to mean. Now it just means, do you identify with the side? Which side are you on? Right? That's pretty much that's pretty much all it is. In the old days, when presidents from the two parties were often being... Um, do you remember the old days, those of you who are old? Do you remember when people would say, there is not a whit of difference between the, the Democratic president and the Republican president. They're both going to be big business, big war. They're both basically the same person. Under that situation, the person you did not vote for could get elected... And you could, over time, warm up to that person even though you didn't vote for them. But in this last election, there was President Trump way over here, Hillary Clinton way over here, and it is not reasonable to assume that the people are going to be changing sides at that distance, at least in large numbers. <laughs> so the presidential approval poll, let's, let's grow up, you know, let Let's, let's put on our, our, you know, our big people pants and just admit it doesn't mean anything anymore because of our unique polarization. Now, in a non-polarized world, it could become meaningful again. I could imagine having two candidates run who are kind of similar, but you know, one is a little more capable and that one gets elected. And over time, people say, yeah, I didn't vote for him, but I, I can see how he's doing a good job or she's doing a good job. <clears throat> Let's talk about Oprah. You want to talk about Oprah? Uh, let's talk about Oprah. I put out a tweet yesterday in which I said that Oprah is too smart to run for president. I put out my tweet before I'd actually listened to the, um, the audio video of her speech at the Golden Globes. I had read about her speech, and people said it was good, and I thought, well, she's Oprah. If she gives a speech, it's going to be good. But then I listened to it. Have you all listened to her, uh, the clips of the speech from the Golden Globes? Okay. Oprah has... <laughs> it, it sure looks like Oprah has decided to run for president. All right, so my tweet was that she's too smart to run for president. Her speech at the Golden Globes is unambiguously, unambiguously signaling her interest in running for president. So I said that she wouldn't do it. She's clearly signaling that she's, she's considering it. All right? And she's probably you know, trotting out the possibility, judging reactions. You know, there's a lot of thinking that goes into this. You don't, you don't make this decision over the weekend, right? It's something, it takes months to really talk yourself into running for president, I would imagine. <clears throat> so I'm going to stick with my um, prediction, although I'm far less confident in it, having now heard her political speech. As people have noted, if she gets into the primaries, she would, you know, she would run the table on the, the Democrat side. So she could easily get nominated because the, the Democrats want to win. They want to win really bad. <laughs> Man, do they want to win. <clears throat> um, but uh, she's going to have the same problem that Hillary Clinton had, which is that um, her advantage, 
that she should be bringing is that she can bring us all together. But as soon as she gets in the race, she is going to be, uh, let's say, you know, painted by the opposition. She's going to be reframed in a way she doesn't like. And it's very quickly going to become, oh, it's because you're a woman, it's because you're black, you know, you're back to um, identity politics, and the Republicans will just, will just have a field day with it. Then the opposition research will start digging into her personal life, her business decisions, things she said. Uh, and here's the real killer. If you were to go back to all of her Oprah TV shows and find all of the pseudoscience things which she has backed, now I don't, I don't have a mental catalog in my head of what those are, so you might have to fact check this a little bit. But, you know, I believe there's a whole lot of stuff in her catalog of, you know, TV shows that would not be considered science. <laughs> so, if she's running to be the leader of the side that's blaming the other side for being science deniers, she's got a real problem there. Uh, she's never had her own children. Yeah, I think... I think the fact she's not married, doesn't have children, might it, you know, it might have some influence on some conservative voters. I don't know that that's a, in 2018 or 2020, if she were to run, I don't know that her marital status would make a difference. You know, I, I think maybe that's, that thinking might be a little dated. It might make a small difference, but I don't think it's a big one. Um, Uh, in reality, she's a hot mess. Yeah. Comment on the BBC tape. Uh, what BBC tape? There might be a story I've missed. Uh, she said all old people have to die. Fake news. Here's another fake news alert. Have you been seeing in the news over and over again and on the internet that Oprah is quoted as saying that we can't have equality uh, because until all the old white, white people die. All right. Um, I haven't... Yeah, oh, the BBC said all old white people need to die. Um, <clears throat> it's fake news. Yes, she said it. Yes, it's on video. Yes, you saw the video. It's fake news. Why is it fake news? Because the context is, is changed. Here's the context. The context is that as long as the people who are the, you know, let's say the architects of racism are alive and they don't plan to change what, what they're doing, there's not much you can do. But age and nature will eventually solve for that because young people bring new ideas. That's what Oprah was saying. I haven't even listened to the you know, I haven't listened to it in context, but I can tell you without even listening to the context, clearly that's what she was saying. All right, so don't fall for the fake news that Oprah said uh, white people need to die. All right, that's fake news. She was talking in context. She was talking about the long run. <laughs> she was talking about demogra demographic shifts. But if you take that one little clip out of context... It's fake news. Don't fall for that. You can see it everywhere. You can see it all over Fox News. You can see it in all the, the right-wing sources. All your right-wing friends are going to tweet it. Just don't fall for it. It never should have been said. Wrong. <laughs> she said it uh, in a way that could be taken out of context, and that part was perhaps a, you know, a media mistake. But the point is one that 100% of us agree with, which is that when new people replace old people, the way of thinking in society changes too. That's all she said. <clears throat> you cannot hold that against her. Um, <laughs> who would be her VP? Well, here's an interesting question. 
Suppose Oprah and Mark Cuban were both interested in running for president as Democrats. Suppose one of them had to be the vice president candidate and one of them was going to be the presidential candidate. Which would be which? Which package would be stronger? Would you have a stronger president? Would you have a stronger package as President Winfrey? Or Vice President Winfrey with a President Mark Cuban? Which, which would be a stronger combination? <laughs> well, I don't think we're ever going to see that possibility because I can't imagine Mark Cuban even being interested in the vice president job. And I certainly can't see Oprah interested in the vice president job. So I'm going to predict that that just will never happen because they're both, they're both presidential you know, um, possibilities. And I, don't, I can't see either of them taking the vice president job. Biden doesn't have a chance. So if you were to start with, <clears throat> let me give you a, a quiz here. Um, <laughs> so let me give you a quiz here. If you started with President Trump and everything about him, and then you started subtracting from President Trump his interesting personality, his, his ability to persuade. If you took out of him his enormous business success, you took out of him his, his negotiating ability, his strategic ability, his, his sense of how to control the conversation, if you took that out of him. If you took his sense of humor out of him and you stripped all of those things out of President Trump, what would be left? Joe Biden. You would have Joe Biden. <laughs> Somebody, yeah, I broadcast that punchline ahead of time. Yeah, if you started with President Trump and removed everything you like about him, you would have Joe Biden. Boring, unsuccessful, uh, unable to persuade, a bad negotiator. That's who you'd have. So when the, the left thinks, um, yeah, we're going to run Joe Biden against him, it's everything wrong. Like Biden would be the biggest mistake they ever made. Now, I'm not sure he wants to run. He may just want to be part of the conversation and sell his book and, and whatever else, uh, which are worthy causes. I'm, a, I'm an author, so I'm okay with that. <clears throat> All right, so somebody asked me about James uh, Dam... What's his last name? Damrose? And his lawsuit against Google... He's suing Google for discriminating against white males. And somebody said, would it be smart for uh, a Damore? Yeah, James Damore. Uh, would it be smart for Black Lives Matter Hog Newsom to support that? Because in both cases, it's discrimination by race? And the answer is no, it would not be smart for Hawk to support that. <laughs> no, it would not. <laughs> uh, I, I, won't even, I don't even need to say more about that. No, it would not be smart for him to support that. Um, <laughs> read the document, it makes Google look awful. Well, I do believe that James has a case. So I think James Damore's case against Google is completely valid, given what we know. I mean, the, you know, it's, it's ahead of a, a legal action, so we may not have all the correct information. There may be context that we don't know, et cetera. But on the surface of it, it looks pretty legitimate to me which doesn't mean he's going to win, but it, on the surface, it looks legitimate. Um, it looks like bad optics because he's suing for white people. Well, well, that's exactly what he's doing. So I don't know, can you have bad optics when it's just completely accurate? That's just what he's doing. 
Scott, did you experience what James Damore did? Yes, I did. Some of you might know my backstory, um, but this was many, many years ago, you know, decades ago. When I worked for a big bank in the city, uh, I was called into my boss's office one day and I was told directly, so this is not me interpreting what somebody was thinking, I was told directly that I wouldn't be promotable for the foreseeable future because I was white and male. Uh, and the, the, the bank was under a lot of pressure from the, the local press. This was in San Francisco, yeah. By the local press, because they didn't have any diversity in senior management. And the bank said, yeah, you know, we're going to have to fix our diversity problem. But the only way we can do that is to just put the brakes on uh, promoting white males, you know, until we have some diversity. So uh, I quit immediately, and Wells Fargo bought that bank, bought Crocker Bank, where I was working. So I, I don't blame Wells Fargo for anything that happened in the prior bank, right? It's a change of ownership. Um, and then I went immediately to Pacific Bell, the local phone company, and I got on their management track. You know, I was on literally, I was literally on the list of people they were grooming for promotion to higher management. And one day my boss called me into his office there and he said, again, in direct language, there's no ambiguity here, he said it directly, that uh, the company was getting in trouble for lack of diversity and just exactly like the bank, same story. And he said that until further notice, they could not consider, even consider, promoting a white male. That was the day I decided to start Dilbert. So um, when people talk about white privilege, you know, it's not a it's not a clean concept because you saw in this story that there was a whole there was a whole lot of uh, non-white privilege <laughs> that was applied to me in that specific part of the country in that specific time. You know, it was a very unique time in the country. But because I have my uh, white privilege, uh, I simply just changed directions and became rich. So I don't know how easy it would be to do what I did if I were not a white male. That's sort of an open question. Um, but that, that's what happened to me. And when people hear that story, they, people will often say, oh, you know, stop complaining, you know, about your little problems. Um, and I say, I didn't complain. You know, it's been decades, and I have, I have, I don't believe, I have ever put it in the form of a complaint. I put it in the form of a story. It is simply what happened. The events that I I explained to you are just the facts as they happened, and I don't think there's any dispute about them. There's there's nobody who was involved then who would give you a different story. Um, and I have to admit, in order to get from a place where there's no diversity in the important jobs to a place where there is, you know, you gotta, you gotta break some nuts and my nuts are the ones that got broken. Um, so on a, on a meta level, it's hard for me to argue that, you know, some people had to get screwed so that other people could get a, a better chance. Uh, but on a personal level, of course, it's a bad day when you're told that you can't get promoted because your skin color or your or your penis. Uh, Oprah is wealthier, yet she still claims to be discriminated against. Well, I think she is. I'm sure that's true. <laughs> I've got sons not okay with them being screwed. You should not be okay with them being screwed on an individual level, but they do have options. As long as we have a good economy, there's enough for everybody. All right, um, I'm going to go do some other stuff today, but make sure you see the Dr. Drew uh, uh, interview that I linked to in my Twitter account about Dr. Bandy Lee, it will make your 
jaw drop. And can't wait for Wednesday and the fake news awards. I will try to 